It's certainly good to be here with you all. Um, I was just talking to Lee and, and a few others before the service. Um, so I've we're we're fairly jealous of our uh, uh, pastors up there. So we don't, you know, we only have two of us, and uh, I know that's more than you guys have. So I'm not trying to <laughs> rub it in or anything, but um, but we've been around for a lot longer, and um, so we're very grateful um, to be able to help when we can. And um, it is my absolute privilege to to be here with you all uh, today. Normally, you guys get to have Bruce, and so Bruce is filling in. Uh, Pastor Bruce is filling in for me. This morning uh, at our church, leading worship and preaching, which is kind of the, that's the job that we end up doing when uh, when one of us is gone. So last week I was uh, leading worship and preaching and uh, at our church, and now Bruce is doing the same uh, for me this morning. But it's an absolute joy to be here with you all. Um, I wish I, I had been able to be here more times with you. I, I was just looking back at uh, the last time I was here was about a year ago before you all were in this space. Um, it was right at the end of the, the time that you guys were in the, um, the school, um, so last August. But um, my wife and, and, uh, and I are, are just uh, so very thankful for so many people in this congregation. I, I look out and I see definitely some familiar faces, but we also see a lot of new faces, faces that we didn't know from people who were with us uh, before the church plant uh, a few years ago. Now that's been, is that four, has it been four years now? It's been four years now. That's incredible. So um, we're so very grateful to see what God has done here in your church. This is an absolute blessing, and thank you for, to the worship team. I normally am up here leading this uh, worship on uh, at our church, and so it's an absolute privilege to, to sit and worship with you all this morning. Well, speaking of a few years ago, uh, this is... Uh, I guess the same year that the church plant uh, launched. So you all started, I believe, in September of 2018, right? So just a, a couple months after that, on November 17, 2018, John Allen Chow was killed by natives of North Sentinel Island in the Bay of Bengal. I don't know if any one of you would have be familiar of this story. Uh, he was attempting to share the gospel of Jesus with an isolated, hostile tribe of hunter-gatherers. Um, he was just 26 years old. Did you guys see this at all? No? The tribe and the island, um, which I think we've got a, a couple of pictures actually up here. I'll have them put that up here. So this is John Allen Chow and uh, North Sentinel Island in the Bay of Bengal. Uh, both the tribe and the island are protected by Indian law. And throughout recent history, there have been many attempts to contact the, these people, but they've mostly been met with hostility. So little is known about their language or culture. And in the wake of his death, the internet exploded with criticism uh, against John Chow, claiming that he was ignorant, that he was culturally insensitive, that he was foolish, um, even considering himself a, a deserving of his own death. Uh, he was above the law, and uh, this tribe didn't, neither needed nor wanted anything from anyone outside. Um, even John's father, a self-professed Christian, publicly claimed that he was a victim of fanatical evangelical extremism. But those who knew John Chow well paint a different picture of this young man who lost his life. According to them, John was neither ignorant nor culturally insensitive. He felt called to evangelize these people on this island after a high school missions trip uh, to Mexico, actually. I don't know where Kevin went off to, but um, John had the experience of several missions trips throughout college, and he trained with an organization called All Nations. Um, he was well-read in missionary and anthropological works, and this trip in 2018 was actually the result of uh, extensive planning and prayer. He was well aware of the risks to himself and to the Sentinelese. He took various steps to protect the islanders from risk of infection, and he, was, he, was, he had studied these kinds of things, making contact with uncontacted people groups. But the day before his death, John was taken to North Sentinel Island by local fishermen 
um, and this is just an aside, but they were Karen Christians, if that means anything. Uh, Adoniram Judson, the early missionary to Burma, uh, converted the Karen people, uh, or played a role in their conversion, and these were the fishermen that actually took John Allen Chow. Result, the fruit of many, many years of uh, gospel ministry in these lands, which is just incredible on its own. But they, they took him to North Sentinel Island against the law, I'll remind you, um, and he made contact with the islanders twice on the day before he was killed. Once in the morning, he gave them some fish before he retreated in his kayak, and later he returned and he gave them some other gifts uh, while attempting to preach to them from Scripture. Now, on the second trip, uh, the Sentinelese took his kayak. They shot an arrow at him, which struck his waterproof Bible that he had. So he actually swam back to the fisherman's boat at that point. He wrote the final entries in his journal, and he went to sleep. He resolved to return the following day after all of these contacts. And he asked uh, the next morning for the fisherman to leave without him. So he returned to North Sentinel, uh, and a day afterwards, the local fisherman went to check on him and saw um, what appeared to be um, John's body being dragged on the beach by the islanders. So the question is this. Was John a fool? Was John Allen Chow a fool to give up that which he could not keep? to gain that which he could not lose? That's the question. The world certainly believes as much. Many Christians believe the same, apparently including John's own father. Why would a young man give up his life for this hostile, small, isolated tribe? From all I've read, uh, what his Friends and people who have known him, his, his partners in ministry have said John was seeking to live out the Great Commission in obedience to and out of love for Jesus Christ. He was an example, even if imperfect, and we want to recognize that, of a Christian willing to lose his life for the sake of Jesus Christ and in service of Christ's kingdom. He believed that the gospel of Jesus is truly for all people, from every nation, every tribe, every tongue. So while not all of us here today are going to follow the exact path of John Allen Chow or the path of maybe missionary Jim Elliott, who deeply inspired Chow, I believe that God wants us to see, even today, that the driving motivation Behind each of these missionaries is something that each and every Christian is called to cultivate and embrace. So turn with me in your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 9. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 9. We'll read just a few verses, 23 through 25. Today's sermon is lose your life to save it. The big idea is this. All who follow Christ must carry the cross of suffering and self-denial before wearing the crown of life eternal. So there's, um, there's going to be four parts to this sermon. I want, I want to uh, encourage you to count the cost of following Christ. I want you to gain a supernatural view of self-denial, of suffering, and of loss. But I also want to encourage you to remember that you stand in a long line of losers, and I want to encourage you to carry your cross now with the sure hope of wearing the crown of life forever. So, Luke 9, 23 through 25, we'll read. And he said to all, Jesus speaking, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? I want to pray 
before we jump into this text. Dear Heavenly Father, um, we come to you grateful for all that you are to us in the person of Jesus Christ. We're grateful for the gospel, uh, the good news that we are freed from the power and penalty of sin and accepted before you. We have right standing and reconciliation by grace through faith alone and Christ alone to the glory of God alone. Father, we thank you so much uh, for conferring on us all of these benefits. But Lord, we, we turn to you this morning recognizing that you call us Uh, Lord, even in these verses to difficult, hard truths, but also hopeful and confident promises that you have for us. We ask that you give us eyes to see and ears to hear what your spirit is saying to us this morning through this word. We ask in Christ's name, amen. So first, count the cost of following Christ. Look with me at verse 23. And he said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. One of the most striking features of this passage is that Luke uses the word cross for the first time here in his gospel. Not in reference to Jesus, but to his disciples. And this is also true in Matthew's gospel and in Mark's gospel. Uh, While Jesus prophesied about his death in verse 22, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised, there's no word of the method or mode of how he will be killed. Um, So no word of the Romans' involvement or Jesus' own cross. So we know when Luke wrote his gospel, of course, that he already knew Jesus would die on a cross. We know that Jesus knew that when he prophesied his death. But in the timeline of Jesus' ministry, these words to the disciples come before Jesus carries his own cross. So I believe that God wants us to see that the cross is meant to be carried by Christians as much as it is to be carried by Christ. Now, we might even say the cross is most rightly meant for us, isn't it? We deserve the cross. We deserve death, but Jesus joyfully carries the cross that we rightly deserve out of sheer grace. So the image of the cross for the disciples, when they're hearing this from Jesus, would have been familiar to them. It was a normal Roman executionary practice. I mean, it's crazy that it would be normal. I mean, when you think about what that is. But even if it was reserved for certain capital offenses, they had seen crucifixions, okay? So the, the disciples know when Jesus says, let him take up his cross, they, under, they have a context for that. They understand what that means, right? They understand the image is a one-way journey, a no turning back, everyday commitment to self-denial of the highest degree. That's what this call is. He said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. That's a radical condition for following Christ. And it's tempting to think that Jesus is speaking maybe to just some elite class of Christians, right? Like pastors or missionaries or someone like that. But the words anyone in this verse and whoever in verse 24 don't give us that option. This is a call for all who claim the name of Christ. Deny yourself. Take up your cross every day. And when Jesus says let him deny himself, he makes it clear that his followers are not to be governed by mere self interest. This is a supernatural and extremely countercultural statement because we live in a world saturated with self-interest, don't we? Do what's best for you. But Jesus has a bigger picture of what's best for us. And he, sometimes our ultimate good requires that we deny ourselves of various comforts for the sake of faithfully following Jesus. Self-denial might be uh, involve several things. I, mean, I could list a bunch here. 
could be resisting wrong or disproportionate desires. It might also be regulating our enjoyment of good things. This could mean giving up things like discretionary income or time watching TV or even a dream vacation for the sake of helping others in need. It could mean forgoing the security of living in a good neighborhood or a part of town to have a gospel presence in a dangerous neighborhood. It could mean leaving the comfort of your hometown, your state, or country to share the good news of Jesus with those who haven't heard. Self-denial could mean leaving your well-established home church of many years to launch a new gospel-centered church. Could be, on the opposite side, sending valued and loved members of your well-established church to launch a new gospel-preaching church. Could mean taking a low-income job at a teaching, uh, teaching at a Christian school. Could mean giving up extra income to stay at home and raise your children in the fear and knowledge of the Lord. Self-denial could mean resisting the impulse to find temporary gratification in social media like TikTok or Instagram or Facebook. Could mean deleting your apps, closing your accounts, investing that time in studying scripture or lifting up others in prayer. Again, I'm just throwing out hypotheticals here. You see what sticks. Um, Self-denial might look like living below your means to give generally to the church, to missionaries, to a pregnancy center, or toward other God-glorifying ministries or needs. But at a bare minimum, it, it does involve the denial that you and your needs and interests come first. It also involves denying that your felt needs and desires are even always good or to be trusted. As Jeremiah 17, 9 says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. So a Christian's self-denial is motivated by the supreme love for God and others, right? That's the greatest command. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's what it means to be a Christian. That's like the heartbeat of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. The self is dethroned in order to place Christ on the throne of the heart. Deny yourself and follow me, right? The idea that we're dethroning self to enthrone Christ on our hearts. So how does following Jesus dethrone your self-centered heart today? That's the question. Or even this week, where might God be calling you to say no to yourself? I want you to give that some thought. But if that's not hard enough, and it is hard, I mean, I understand these are hard words. Jesus goes a step further. Not only does he say that Christians are to deny themselves, but they are also to pick up their cross daily. That is to say, you must daily embrace, this is, this is radical, this is countercultural, embrace the, the suffering and loss that might come on account of your faith in Christ. And each, words, each, each of those words is significant. The text does not say, notice, take up a cross. Did you see that? It says, let each take up his cross. The cross that you are called to carry likely will not be a literal cross of wood, but each of us has a personalized cross to carry after Christ. That's why I picked that image for today's sermon slide um, Christians are little Christ, united to him by faith and following in his footsteps. Now, I want to be clear. That, that does not mean that you atone for your own sins. That is the result of Christ's cross alone. Jesus' death and resurrection are the only basis for our right standing with God. That is why the gospel is such good news, isn't it? While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. But hear me, Christian faith is absolutely infinitely more about what God has done for you in Christ than about what you can do for God. I want to recognize that. His cross is the basis of forgiveness from, and freedom from sin and displays the wisdom and power and love of God to, to save sinners by sheer grace. You can't do anything right for God or to make God love you more apart from his work in your life first. Right? His love, his kindness, his mercy, his grace, he sets on us before we love him. 
before the foundation of the world even, he sets his love on his people. So all glory is, is to him, right? Jesus paid it all, we say. But you are still called. You are still called to die to your sin nature daily. And each of us has unique sins and struggles and sufferings and pains to carry on our journey of faith. It's not a one-time thing. It is an everyday reality. In case you're still not sure if this is really an absolutely necessary, so like we need to be convinced. Like, Jesus, do you really think that we should be doing this to follow you? Um, hear the words of Jesus in Luke 14. So just keeping with the same gospel, a few chapters ahead, you can turn there. Luke 14, verses 26 through 33. Jesus says again, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock, saying, This man be began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to encounter another king in war, will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? If not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. And this is even more strict, like clear words than our text today, isn't it? Did you see that in verse 27? It said, Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. So you have your own cross, and you must carry it to follow Christ. So count the cost. If you're not willing to let go of everything that you are and everything that you have in this journey to follow Christ, then you cannot be his disciple. There is simply no such thing as a comfortable Christian life lived for oneself. It doesn't exist. The Christian life is a cross-bearing life lived for Jesus. So are you comfortable? That's a question. Does your faith in Christ cost you anything at all? I want to I be understanding here that the, it doesn't cost the same for people, right? It doesn't cost you the same as it does someone else, but it must cost you something. There is some cross for you to bear, and you must bear it. There's no opting out. So if you can't think of a single way that your commitment to Christ costs you something in this life, you may need to do some soul searching. You may not be a disciple of Christ. Jesus says if you do not bear your own cross, you cannot be his disciple. So who do you live for? Whose kingdom do you serve? The kingdom of self or the kingdom of Christ? Consider the personal cross that you might take up to follow Jesus. Living for Jesus' sake, loving him above all else, that might strain your relationships with close friends or family. Maybe your Christian convictions could uh, land you in court or cost you your, your job. Your, I don't know. Could completely alienate you from those that you love and hold dear because you just don't see things the same way. A daily commitment to deny yourself is itself a heavy cross to bear. And I want to I be clear again. It is not natural for us to think this way. Right? It is absolutely unnatural. It takes a supernatural frame of mind to embrace the insecurity, the relational pains, the material losses that might result from your commitment to the lordship of Christ over your life. It's not natural to think of yourself last. So you must gain a supernatural perspective. You must be transformed by the renewing of your mind, as Romans 12 says. That's the second point. Gain a supernatural view of self-denial, suffering, and loss. Look with me at verse 24 of our text here in chapter 9. Whoever would save his life 
will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. What Jesus is claiming is truly counterintuitive. To enjoy the crown of life, you must first endure the cross of death for Jesus' sake. Lose your life if you want to save it. Now that it's just not natural, right? It's a paradox. It's a seemingly contradictory statement that proves a very real and important point. You see, by nature, we tend to protect and preserve our lives and our livelihoods at all costs. That's why we insulate ourselves against pain and hardship and loss. We have insurance. We put a little extra money aside in emergency funds. It's why we look at crime rates in neighborhoods before buying a house, settling our family in a community. It's why we lock our doors at night. And that natural inclination isn't bad. I, I want to recognize that. We are not called to lose our lives on account of carelessness or you know thoughtlessness, but on account of Christ. We see that when Jesus says, whoever loses his life for my sake. So the idea is that Christians assign more worth to Jesus than their own lives. It is worth knowing and loving and being united with Christ, whatever the cost. And this call stretches us to think supernaturally about the various crosses we carry and losses we experience in our lives on account of our faith in him. I was struck by a um, book by a Puritan author, John Downham, uh, on anger. In, in this book, one of Downham's suggested remedies to cure unjust anger, as he calls it, toward others is remembering that all things that happen in our lives are allowed by God, whose purpose it is to work all things to the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. So that includes even other people's sin against us. Let that sink in for a minute. How in God's sovereignty he is not responsible for other people's sin, but allows and even orchestrates it for our own good is Mysterious, but it's exactly what happens in Genesis 50, 20, if you know the story of Joseph. Um, This is what uh, Joseph said, right? He said, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. The sin, (laughs) like, it's incredible. So if we remember this, um, Downham says we can avoid being unjustly angry toward those, even those who sin against us. Like That's a really helpful tip, I, I guess. I don't know if that really helps me or not. I need to remember that maybe, but the principle teaches us that real suffering and real loss are not contrary to God's purposes for us and his plan, but are part of his design to work all things for your ultimate good. So we have to take the supernatural view of self-denial and suffering and loss. We must look at our personalized crosses from the top down. Okay, from the top down, from God's point of view. You see, from our point of view, the suffering and the loss and the pain, they appear like, I was trying to think of a good analogy. To me, it's like a waterfall in the stream and you're you're, like, you see it coming and you're swimming and you're like paddling as hard as you can in the opposite direction and you're like, I want to avoid that thing at all costs, right? That is how I, I view this. We're constantly trying to swim against the current of the pain and the loss and the suffering. But I want to I encourage you this morning, from God's point of view, think about this. From God's point of view, that waterfall is but a minuscule cascade in the stream that will carry you to Christ, to the source, the very fountain of living water himself. And to heaven, a place where the sea, which represents uh, chaos of, of life and the suffering of life, where that will be no more. These light momentary afflictions, says Paul, are preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. You and I don't naturally think like that. This is a supernatural, God-given, heavenly perspective on our earthly sorrows. And it's a supreme act of faith. You just can't think like that apart from the very Spirit of God transforming and renewing your mind. And if that seems absurd absurd to you, absolutely impossible to see how those things can be true. 
Again, I would plead with you to search your heart and your soul because you must be born again by God's spirit to think this way. Giving up your comfort, picking up your cross each day is an unnatural, impossible task. It really is. But thankfully, we serve a God who makes the impossible possible time and time again. Think of this. We serve a God who merely spoke our vast universe into existence. A God who fulfilled his promise of a miraculous birth to parents well beyond childbearing age. A God who miraculously delivered his chosen people from slavery to one of the ancient world's greatest superpowers. We still marvel at the pyramids today. Think about that. He preserved their lives in a wilderness through impossible means. Bread from heaven, water from a rock. Amazing. We serve a God who causes the lame to leap and the blind to see and the deaf to hear and he raises the dead. The list goes on and on, but the idea is simple, that the almighty God that Christians serve has made the impossible possible time and time. Again, all things are possible for him. So maybe you're struggling to see how this self-denial, suffering, loss thing is possibly for, it could even be for your good. But maybe you've forgotten, uh, you need to be reminded, or maybe you've just never even considered who God really is. You need to remember the God who speaks to Job in his suffering. And I'm just paraphrasing. I mean, I'm, I'm, I guess that's not a, oh, abridging would be the, the best word, okay? I'm taking selected readings from several chapters of Job and some, like, abridging them. This is God speaking to Job. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Have you commanded the morning since your days began and caused the dawn to know its place? Have you entered into the springs of the sea or walked in the recesses of the deep? Have you entered the storehouses of snow? Must be big for the Midwest, I guess. Or have you seen the storehouses of the hail, which I have reserved for the time of trouble, for the day of battle and war? What is the way to the place where the light is distributed? or where the east wind is scattered upon the earth? Can you bind the chains of the Pleiades or loose the cords of Orion? Do you know the ordinances of the heavens? My goodness, the James Webb images, if that doesn't astound you with the glory of God and his majesty. Can you establish their rule on earth? Can you lift up your voice to the clouds that a flood of waters may cover you? Can you send forth lightnings that they may go and say to you, here we are at your command? Shall a fault finder contend with the Almighty? He who argues with God, let him answer it. Again, I'm abridging, but the, the point of Job chapters 38 through 41, the result of this is that Job is absolutely floored. He's humbled. He's speechless. What can he say? What can we say? God knows all things. All of God's judgments are right and true. We are of little account. So we're counting that cost, right? But the supernatural view of all of the hardships of our lives after Christ means that through the mind of faith given by the Spirit, we know that God is working all things for our good. That's why we can trust Jesus' words in verse 24. Whoever would save his life will lose it. I don't know how that's possible, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it? It's incredible. I don't understand that naturally. But Jesus calls you to a great investment while promising you the most astounding return. You are no fool to give up what you cannot keep to gain what you cannot lose. This is more than worth all, all the hardships in life, all the hardships of following Christ, standing fast in your commitments to whatever that looks like in your, your life, whether that's, I mean, we, we know people, we have family members that we love who who see the way of Jesus as hateful, who can't begin to see how we could 
view following Christ as a good thing. Calling what is good evil and what is evil good, for us to stand fast in that kind of culture, it's going to be hard, folks. It's going to be even harder. But all of it is worth it. All of it. The real cost of following Christ, there is a real cross for you to bear. It's going to be hard. But it's also true that Christ's yoke is easy and his burden is light. He will give rest to your soul. It's true that God himself will transform you by the power of his spirit to make you capable of obeying what he commands. All of these realities are gloriously true as hard as it seems to hold them all together. So if you've grasped the magnitude of God, his power, his perfect faithfulness to fulfill his promises, and his goodness as our loving heavenly father, you can joyfully heed Jesus' words to deny yourself and take up your cross daily. 1 Peter 4, uh, 13 says, Rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. This is a supernatural view of self-denial, suffering, and loss, and it is a view that has been shared by believers through millennia. So remember that you stand in a long line of losers. That's the third point. This isn't in the text per se, and it'll be a little bit shorter, but I want to give you an overview of the ways that Christians have suffered for Christ. So whether you're giving up good things or going through bad times for Jesus, you're not alone. Christians have answered this radical call by God's grace throughout centuries. From the earliest days, Christians suffered public insult, persecution, the seizure of their property, Hebrews 10. Uh, By grace, they did this with joy, knowing that they had a better abiding possession. Stephen was killed by members of the Jewish Sanhedrin for his unwavering commitment to boldly proclaim Christ, Acts 7. The Roman emperor Nero, after the great fire of Rome, blamed Christians for this and persecuted them fiercely. The historian Tacitus recounts this in his annals. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read this quote. Nero, this is, what, this, is, uh, this is Tacitus recounting what happened. Nero substituted as culprits and punished with the utmost refinements of cruelty a class of men loathed for their vices whom the crowd styled Christians. You hear how they talk about believers. Christus, the founder of the name, had undergone the death penalty in the reign of Tiberius by sentence of the procurator Pontius Pilate, and the pernicious superstition was checked for a moment, only to break out once more, not merely in Judea, the home of the disease, but in the capital itself, where all things horrible or shameful in the world collect and find a vogue. So, I mean, Rome's not that great either. But then this is what happens to Christians. The confessed members of the sect were arrested next on their disclosures. That word alone, on their disclosures. Are you a follower of Christ? You're picked up by by Nero's men. You're arrested. Are you a follower of Christ? Take a moment. (laughs) Breathe. Yes. Vast numbers were convicted. And he says, derision accompanied their end. They were covered with wild beasts' skins and torn to death by dogs. Or they were fastened on crosses and when daylight failed, were burned to serve as lamps by night. Folks, Persecution is coming for us, and we, we have suffered as Christians. We are being persecuted in real ways, um, even here in the States, especially around the world. It's not the first time. It won't be the last. And honestly, if we're being very honest about our persecutions, we are extremely blessed to not experience this right now. Um, For many, 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 many years, we have been blessed. 
And I don't know if it'll be the same again, but not only did early Christians suffer at the hands of their persecutors, but think about the self-denial here. There's some extra biblical evidence uh, that some willfully sold themselves into slavery to free others or even give the, the proceeds to the poor. It's the letter to Clement. Um, early. Again, not, it's not in the Bible, but it's a, a recognized Christian letter in the early church. The list goes on. Early Christians like Polycarp were executed for their commitment to Christ as Lord. Medieval Christians like Francis of Assisi committed themselves to lives of poverty in preaching the gospel. English reformers Hugh Latimer, Nicholas Ridley, Thomas Cranmer were executed for their commitment to the gospel of salvation by grace through faith alone in Christ alone. Moravian missionaries Johann Leonard Dober and David Nietzschmann were willing to become slaves in order to preach to African slaves on the islands of St. Thomas and St. Croix. Adoniram Judson suffered decades of family loss and physical pain to bring the gospel to the people of Burma. American missionary Jim Elliott and his companions were killed in 1956 attempting to evangelize the Warani people of Ecuador. And John Chow followed in Jim Elliott's force footsteps just four years ago on North Sentinel Island. Christians, as it seems, are a long line of losers. We're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, as Hebrews 11 says, by people marked by their unwavering faith in the goodness and faithfulness of God to fulfill his promises, willing to follow Christ wherever he calls, to whatever he calls them. So if you're not quite convinced of the goodness of God and calling you to deny yourself and take up your cross, I want you to consider the question posed by Jesus in verse 25. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? And the answer, of course, is nothing. You have nothing to gain and everything to lose by avoiding Christ's call to carry your cross. You can have all the wealth of the world, but it will not satisfy your soul. It's temporary. You will find no lasting joy in anything the world can give you. You can't take your money with you beyond the grave. You can't be comfortable forever. Your body and mind will fail you. Your beauty will fade. Your strength will wane. Your heart and flesh will fail. Clinging to the comfort and wealth of the world is as wise as clinging to a, sh a ship sinking in the open ocean. You gain nothing but your ruin and destruction. So whatever it is that you're clinging to today that isn't Christ, that's keeping you from following Jesus, I want to plead with you to forsake it, whatever that might be. Forsake it now because you will never be forsaken by Jesus. Whether you're moving your family into a rough neighborhood to be a gospel witness, whether you're alienating yourself from unbelieving family and friends by your faith, whether you're leaving behind a good paying job to pursue ministry or giving up comfortable retirement to further the cause of Christ or even suffering the public reproach of your faith, whatever blessing you give up or suffering you take on for Jesus, you're in good company with this long line of losers. And Jesus is not asking anything of us, anything of you, that he has himself not already done. That is the beauty of the gospel. The gospel of Jesus, crucified and raised, highlights the paradoxical call to receive salvation through loss. And that's the last point here. Carry your cross now to wear the crown of life forever. Lose your life to save it. That's a paradoxical statement, isn't it? Carry your cross to gain a crown. It's a paradox. But the good news about who Jesus is and what he's done could be headlined in a number of surprising paradoxical ways. Consider these. All-powerful God takes helpless human form. All-knowing man exercises perfect humility. Wives, can you imagine that? Master serves his servants. Sinless Savior stands trial for sin. Miraculous healer is mortally wounded. Dead man brings others life. If that doesn't sound like a paradox, my goodness. These headlines seem contradictory, but they illustrate the truth 
of this paradox in Jesus' own life and ministry. He's gone before you. He's carried his cross that you deserve. He's paid the debt that you owe. His cross satisfies the righteous wrath of God against your sin. And they give us this pattern of self-denial, suffering, and loss that result in supernatural gain. We see that in verse 22 where Jesus foretells his own suffering and death and resurrection. It was always God's plan to redeem sinners through a suffering Savior. We're called to carry our crosses if we come after Christ. You deserve your cross and you're called to carry your cross, but Christ leads the way. He carried a cross, his cross for you first. And in fact, that actually opens the way for you to carry your own cross after him, to experience the salvation and life he's purchased by his blood. Apart from that, you could do nothing to please God. You couldn't love him. You couldn't follow him. You couldn't serve him. You couldn't suffer for him. His cross frees you from the penalty and power of sin so that your suffering now is a participation in the very sufferings of Jesus. Your death is bound up with his death. Your life is bound up with his life. And as paradoxical as it sounds to say, to say this, we have one day the sure hope of wearing a crown of life eternal when we carry the cross now. That's what James says. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. The eternal weight of glory really and truly will outweigh the temporary afflictions of your life. It's worth following Jesus whatever the cost. To live is Christ and to die is truly gain. There's more joy. There's more peace. There's more life to be gained through trusting in Christ each and every day. There's more than you can ever find in this life. And it's more secure than anything you can cling to in this world. So don't tether yourself to a sinking ship. Anchor your soul in Jesus. Through his death you can live. And you are called to carry your own cross if you would wear that crown of life. By God's grace, this is possible. It's not a self-salvation program. When Jesus says, lose your life to save it, it doesn't mean that you are the source of your salvation. God has done this. It is a call to experience union with Jesus in all that he has already done. In his suffering, in his death, and in future glory and eternal life with him. You may not feel it's possible to live this way. And again, I'm I'm not saying that all of us are called to be like John Allen Chow or Jim Elliott or any of the the people that I mentioned. But if, if that just seems so far out of reach for you today, like, man, those are just radical Christians. No, they're just Christians trying to follow Jesus and be obedient to him. I want to encourage you that God makes the impossible possible time and time again. So our daily reliance on Jesus and his cross is the very source of strength for you to carry your own cross, whatever that might be. So count the cost of following Jesus. I don't know what that is for you. I don't know what that personal cross is that you are to bear. It's not a generic one. It's personalized. It's custom made for you. You have a cross to bear to follow Jesus. I want you to consider what it costs you to to follow him. Gain that heavenly perspective on your self-denial, on your suffering, on your loss. Know it's worth the cost. And I want you to remember that you stand in a long line of losers who, by the way, are truly winners, right? You're not alone. And take heart, because your cross is for a moment, but your crown will be forever. Let's pray.